That story is amazing. Can we give it up one more time for Jamie and, um, and for Allie? If you're ever wondering if God can use you in the workplace or how that's ever going to happen, that's a, that's a great example. You never know the people that you come across every single day, what they're going through, what they've gone through in this last year alone. That's an amazing story, an amazing way to start today with some hope and encouragement. Uh, we are in the middle of a series right now called The Moral of the Story. How many of you have enjoyed this uh, series we are right now in? Coming off our June at the movies where we took um, some movies, some earthly stories, and we gave them some heavenly meaning. We're doing that as well here in the month of July. We are taking the stories that Jesus told, which are parables, and we are looking at their meaning as well. So my name is Megan, and I am thrilled to be speaking today because I like stories. And more often than not, I like the short ones because my attention spans about that. Ah, that big sometimes, especially on Sunday morning. So that's the good thing about these stories uh, that Jesus told in the Gospels is that they're pretty short. Um, there's about 36 of them in the Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and they're, they're not too long. Some of them are only a few verses, and some have some explanation um, written down. Some don't, so they're kind of left for um, interpretation. And that's what we're doing here in the moral of the story. And the cool thing is we, we, we're here to learn more about Jesus. We're here to learn more about him um, and, and to take a look at scripture and, and what we can learn from it. But the cool thing is with these parables is we're not only lear learning what Jesus taught, but we're learning how Jesus taught, which is important too. It's important to know that Jesus knew his audience Jesus knew the people that he was speaking to in that time. That's something important for anyone who is speaking is to know who they are speaking to, right? So Jesus is speaking to these people, these crowds, which include the disciples. And those people were very different from us today. They were farmers, mostly. They were people who were really connected to their land. And that's not necessarily a lot of us here in the heart of Louisville, <laughs> where we are uh, standing today. Maybe you are watching online and you're tuning in from maybe Oklahoma or Idaho or other states where there's a lot of corn and things like that. So welcome to you, all those farmers. They're like, we're farmers. How many of you have a little garden? Yes, yes, some tomatoes, some fruit. Maybe you have a house plant, <laughs> an aloe vera plant. My mom told me those can't die, but I killed it. So we're not... In 2021, it's not, not necessarily the same. So we do have to open up some spiritual eyes and see because Jesus is teaching to these people in parables and he's using things like planting and sowing, reaping and harvesting. If he was speaking to us right now, he might use terms like Netflix to uh, illustrate his messages or cyber cars or Amazon Prime, you know. Just the things that we could understand. Kobe and LeBron. How many of you guys saw Space Jam already? No? Oh, two thumbs up. We watched Space Jam. It's thumbs down. We're not reviewing movies here. We're learning about the Bible. It's a good movie. You should watch it. I like movies. Um, but like I said, my attention span is short, so I know some of you are that way too. If you have ADD, ADHD, that's okay. Uh, we're going to take a nice little ride together. We won't read too, too much scripture, but we are going to get into that today. Uh, so like I said, there's about 36 parables. Um, we are taking a look at just a, a couple of them. But it's really important to know, too, that why he taught in parables. The first reason is that it was prophesied that he would do so. So some of you might not know, but Jesus coming to earth as the Son of God, as the Messiah, was a prophecy fulfilled. So before he ever came... There were people who heard from God that knew a Messiah was coming. And in Psalm 78, 2, it was also prophesied, for I will speak to you in parables that this man, the Messiah, would come, and that is how he would teach, which is telling these stories to illustrate his point. And the second reason he spoke in parables is to help those that were listening to better understand. 
in terms that were their lingo and something that they could relate to at the time. And I also think he did it because he wanted to uh, excite a little bit of curiosity. Because when we have a puzzle in front of us or something that's not quite clear and it, it requires a little bit more brain work, we're really excited to figure it out. We're like, oh, yeah, I can definitely, uh, give me this. I'm going to find the answer. And I know we still like to do this today because, like, when we're scrolling on Facebook and they're like, solve this puzzle of this math equation. And if you do, you'll be blessed for 16 hours. And you're like, yes, I'm going to figure that out right now on Facebook. And I'm going to share it. And everyone's going to know that I figured it out. It's like, the Where's Waldo stuff, you like find, and like all the comments are like, I can't find it. You're hoping to like find it in the comments before you actually spend time to find it. We like that. We like a little bit of curiosity, you know, in our brain and a little bit of a blurred image so we can really figure out and press in and know what is it that's going on? What is it that's being communicated? We've heard about Pastor Katie's parable of the mustard seed, where a little bit of faith, a tiny little seed with enough God can do a lot, can live on forever, can impact so, so many. We heard last week from Pastor Joe the parable of inner purity, how God looks at the heart and that if it's left unchecked, that it can defile a man. And today I want to talk to you about the parable of the wheat and the weeds. The, the wheat with a W-H and the weeds. I was preparing for this. People are like, we can't really tell if you're saying weeds or wheat. So I'm going to try to enunciate when I say it and say wheat and weeds. So you're not, like confused. How many of you had a teacher that like I had one one time where they said why? They were like, why? And it was really annoying when you're in school, but you're like, now I know why they did that. So I would knew what they were saying when they said it. So I won't be super annoying and say wheat, but wheat, wheat and Weeds, that is the name of the parable we're going to be talking about today. So before I read it and I open up our Bible and, and read some scripture together, I'd like to know if you've ever been in this situation before, um, a, a kind of case of mistaken identity about someone. So, you know, maybe you're in a public place like the grocery store or you're at a theme park and you see kind of far off in the distance somebody that you recognize Maybe it's like a high school friend. Oh, we shared a class together. Oh, I remember that. Or they're like a friend from way back, um, school age or something. And you're like, hey, hey, Tim. What's, it's me. It's me. You even remember me? And you kind of get a little bit closer. Or like you're in the grocery store and you're pushing a buggy. You're like, oh, I know them. Maybe you don't go and meet people that you see and you know, but I do. So, you know, you're like, oh, hey. And you get real close. And you're like, that is not who I thought it was. And you just turn your buggy the other way, uh, or you're just saying hi and you catch eye contact and you kind of just put your hand down because this person's like, what? I, it's awkward, but I think it's more awkward for the other person because they're like, you got my attention, but you didn't say anything. You just walked away. Well, I, they don't know. Um, this happened to me recently. Um, two weeks ago, my family went on vacation to Texas and we were there at a water park called um, Castaway Cove. And I was chilling. I got some time alone. My husband, Jono, and my mother-in-law took the kids, and they were in the Lazy River. So I got to relax a little bit, have some time to myself. So I was lying on this community chair. You know those chairs that if you think about how many people actually sit on them, you probably wouldn't sit on it. That chair. I was relaxing, and I was people watching, because that's kind of what you do when you're at, with, you, you swim, you sunbathe, you relax, and then you kind of, you kind of people watch. So I was just chilling, not saying anything, relaxing, and there's a bunch of stuff going on in front of me, like kids and adults, whatever, playing in this uh, area, and this like 15, 16-year-old girl comes up out of the water, and she's doing the thing where like you're walking, but you're doing this and talking, and then you're like planning on that forward motion. It's hard to explain, but she was talking to me not looking at me yet, about, like, the ride she just got off of. Like, it's so funny. My guys, whatever. And then she catches eye contact with me, and then she's just flushed instantly. Like, super embarrassed and red. And, of course, I'm here like, the worst part is we didn't say a word, but we both knew what happened. So she just, <laughs> you can't do anything in that moment. You don't really even know how to treat that. So it's just like. My bad. And she moves on. I've had a case of mistaken identity about people, and I'm guessing that you have too. 
we've all sort of been in that situation where either everyone on earth is starting to look the same or I need glasses. I, I don't know what it is. But we've been in those situations where we get a little bit more information, right, and things become a little bit clearer to us. We think we know and understand from a distance, but when we really dig deep and try to see, usually it's a little different than what we first thought it was. And that's exactly what's happening in this parable today that we're going to read. The crowd that Jesus is speaking to has a case of mistaken identity about Jesus, about the Son of Man, and about his kingdom. So what he's doing is teaching to them and bringing some clarity to this world, to the reason why he's here, and to the people involved in that kingdom as well. So what happened to me, before we read, I'll let you know, I read this parable, and I was excited to to preach it because I was like, yeah, wheat and weeds. We could do wheat is all the good stuff, and I'll just preach about how you should sow good stuff into your life and just, you know, get rid of all the bad things in your life. And then you read a little further and you hear an explanation of the parable. And I actually literally realized the way I interpreted it wasn't the way God intended it. So it's important to know when we're reading scripture, sometimes our meaning and understanding isn't necessarily what God's is. That God might see things a little bit different. So I want to let you know. That if you stick around for a while, our big idea for today is that God sees things differently than we do. He does. Obviously, he has a worldview because he created this world. He created us to be in it. And believe it or not, there is a plan for this world. And we are kind of here in the middle of that. Jesus is trying to explain that to people today. Maybe you recently started a relationship with Jesus and you thought it would look a certain way or something would happen. Maybe you've heard someone start a relationship with Jesus and all their desires to sin or their struggle or their addiction went away. And you're like, that happened to me. So I gave my life to Jesus and I'm still struggling. What is going on? Maybe you recently committed your life to Christ and you were super, super excited. Now you have more questions as you read the Bible than you did before. And you're still doubting, and you're like, what is going on? I thought this would be a little bit easier. I thought this life would look different. I thought God was different. Have you ever come to a conclusion about this world that wasn't backed by Scripture? See, sometimes during our reading and our questioning, we can find that God sees things differently, and that's okay. Maybe you've heard it in a a message that maybe Pastor Jason has preached. You've been sitting and listening, and you're like, that's not what I have thought. Or maybe in a song or a book that you were reading or even in Scripture, those moments happen in our lives. Through our journey as a believer and uncovering more of God's word, sometimes there will be a moment when our current understanding of things, like our relationship with Jesus, good and evil, time, are challenged because God sees them different. So in this parable today, they're in the same boat. The Jews are listening to Jesus at the time and see what they thought Jesus would be like is a Messiah or a king. They thought Jesus would have an army. They thought Jesus would sit on a throne and have a crown and be royalty. And what he would do is come and free them from all their oppression take all the evil away and he's going to lead them into heaven and it's just going to be wonderful because our king is here. But in reality, when Jesus came, he was born to a not so wealthy family. He looked like an average person. He walked with normal people and sat and ate dinner in their homes. Kings don't do that. He ate dinner with prostitutes. He rode in on a donkey These aren't things that a king would do. Where's your army, Jesus? Where's your throne? We don't understand. So when they're listening, they're a little bit disappointed, but also very curious about what is this kingdom that you are talking about because we don't see one. They thought Jesus already had a kingdom when in reality he came to establish his kingdom here on earth. 
See, God sees time different. And that's important to know as well when he's teaching. A lot of us see here and now, and we think the beginning of our life and end of our life is all that matters. But Jesus is explaining to the Jews and to us here today, there's more to the story than that. So here in Matthew chapter 13, we have Jesus teaching to these crowd of people who, again, have mistaken identity about him. And that's what we're going to read. So if you want to open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 13, Nothing in this world right now is looking the way they thought it would. So remember that. And Jesus is bringing some clarity to them about what the kingdom of heaven is supposed to be like, what this earth is supposed to be like, and all the roles of people who are in it. So let's open our Bibles together and read this parable called the Parable of the Wheat and the Weeds. We'll start at verse 24. It says, here is another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night, as the worker slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked. No, he replied, you'll uproot the wheat if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles, and burn them, and to put the wheat in the barn. So this is the story, and the disciples and the crowds are listening, and they're going, oh, yeah. Mm Mm-mm. Huh? Like, we we don't get it. We, what? We're hearing you, but again, it's a parable. It's kind of like when you listen to a Joe Rogan podcast, you're like, oh, what did I just listen to for an hour? Rewind it, play it again. Yes, that's exactly what happens. So Jesus teaches a little bit more, and they're kind of like, we need some help understanding this. So that's exactly what they ask him for. In verse 36, he explains it. So he says, uh, then leaving the crowds outside, Jesus went into the house. His disciples said, please explain to us the story of the weeds in the field. We don't understand. So that's just what Jesus does in verse 37. Jesus replied, the son of man, him, or calling himself, that's Jesus. The son of man is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world, and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the harvesters are the angels. Just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will remove from this kingdom everything that causes sin and who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. So, who's uncomfortable reading that? (laughs) See, the Jews thought at that time that Jesus came to vanquish evil. The son of man, the Messiah, the son of God is here So our oppression should stop. He will deliver us, they thought. But in this explanation, Jesus is like, that's not the way God sees it and has intended it now. See, since the beginning of time, it was always supposed to be heaven and earth. Not heaven and hell, but evil came from man. When we decided to push God away, and now our consequence for that is death. It is hell. And so here we are in this story, boom, we get dropped right in the middle, and and we really think, and they thought at that time, Jesus is here to take my pain away. He is here to redeem us. But he is saying here that evil will grow in this world side by side with us, and it won't be until the end of the world, the second coming when he comes back, that that's the time when he removes evil from the world. Even today, you're like, seriously? We still have to live with bad stuff? Yes, that is God's intention here, now. Not always. It wasn't that way. Not at the beginning. But it's this way now. 
So that's not the only thing, obviously, that he's bringing to light and defining for us because God has a view that we don't understand. So what he's doing is showing us what God sees differently in this parable. So there are three things I want to share with you too. The first thing that God sees differently than us, and he's letting us understand, he sees the enemy differently than us here. And he's using this parable to teach us about the enemy. In verse 27, it says, The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? Where did those weeds come from in our good seed? Some of us didn't even know that we had an enemy. Some of us become Christians or we just live our lives and we teach a lot about Jesus, but we have an adversary and his name is the devil. And the moment you commit your life to Jesus, you have a target on your back because now you're ready to do good for the kingdom. And there is a real enemy who wants to stop that good. It happens. The Bible says that we do not deal or battle with flesh and blood, but of spirits and principalities, the things that we cannot see. So Jesus is trying to open up spiritual eyes and show us there's an enemy who does evil, and he's in this world with you until the end of the world, until the end of time. But our way of seeing him is a little bit different. Our way of thinking about the enemy, all we pretty much can think of is it's a Halloween costume. It's a red guy, and he's got some horns and a pitchfork, and there's a really cool Lucifer TV show. I don't know. That's what we know about, about our enemy. But he's bringing some reality to the situation and seeing things differently so that we can be aware about his attacks and how he works. See, he's not just that image that Hollywood kind of portrays of this, you know, red horn, pitchfork guy. The enemy could come in a form of a person that you know or love. The enemy could come in a form of a thought that you have. And he never announces himself. The enemy, we think, is just going to be like, oh, here I am. I'm ready to steal your marriage. But that's not how the enemy works. It's going to come in just a simple form of... Maybe some inappropriate flattery in the workplace from your husband or your wife. It's going to come in the form of you hanging out with your friends and you're chilling and everyone's having a great time. And maybe you guys had dinner together. And when you leave and you're on the ride home and you're by yourself, you think, you know what? None of them really love me. I don't think I really have a real friend in this life. And I don't think I ever will. Those are the plans and the attacks that the enemy puts on us. As soon as we become believers, there are these negative emotions, negative thoughts, the Bible says, that are not from God. They're from the enemy. And we have to take them captive. We have to be aggressive. We have to be ready to handle those things. Because some of us as Christians are dealing and battling with sin and attacks, and we don't know why. But maybe it's because we've underestimated our enemy. Maybe it's because we don't know enough about him or how he works. And that's what Jesus is trying to change and open up our eyes to see about. It's little temptations that in the end game for him is death. But we don't see that. We just see things as, oh, I guess it's just my, my thoughts. I guess I should just see somebody or talk to somebody about it. Hopefully it will get better. Now we battle with spirits. We do. Scripture says that he will come when you least expect it, and he's going to come in disguise. Verse 25 had said, but that night, as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted seeds among the wheat at night. Have you ever been frightened at night? So, so scared. Maybe, I mean, yes, we hear noises sometimes, but I'm talking, talking like scared that like you and your spouse ain't going to, going to see what this. I'm not you. Nope, me, me, mm. you, we're just going to lay here, lay here, but it is. But I'm also talking, talking about those waking up in the middle of the night, your heart, heart is pounding and you've got this pressure on you and you are, you are in the middle of sleep, but you're sweating and you're like, what is, is going on? What's God? Are you, are you trying to wake me up and tell, tell me something? Yes. Yes. That is a, a spirit. We, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, of us and sometimes God, God will wake us up, up to pray against the acts of the, of the enemy. He's ready. 
When we become followers of Jesus, he's ready because he knows uh, we could change, change our whole family. We could change, change our workplace. We could change a lot of people. The enemy, enemy knows that. So he's ready to attack you. Come when you least, you least expect it. When you're chill, when you're on a mountaintop. He's not going to attack you when you're low, low, low. See, he's been doing this for a really long, 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 long time. He's really good at it. He's a professional. He's a professional assassin. This is a serious enemy that we have who does evil, who plants evil into other people, who will plant evil into your heart and in your mind. See, he's not going to come and get you on a Sunday morning when you're here. I'm going to see a victory, you know. It feels good. We're in church. I feel so good. I love Jesus. Everything's awesome. It's going to be like on a Wednesday at 12 o'clock at night when it is you and you and your thoughts and nobody else. And then you think the world would be a whole lot better off without me. I've screwed it up and I can't fix it. Can't fix this. Be better off if I just left. That's a plan that the enemy has against you. I've been there. I've been attacked. My family has been attacked. You might have noticed it or not. But what Jesus is trying to let us see today is that's happening. It could happen to you as a believer. So we need to be ready. How do we prepare for that? The Bible says to stay alert, level-headed, and focused. Focus on Jesus. Focus on his kingdom. Focus on his word. The disciples in Gethsemane were instructed to do this as well, to stay alert, stay awake when Jesus went away to pray. And they fell what? Asleep. And that's when the Romans garden took Jesus. They came. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour it says this in our Bible that he desires to steal from us, to destroy the good that we are going to do for the kingdom. He's a real enemy, and he's got lots of tactics against us that he knows works. So he's not an, an easy enemy to resist. But here's the good news today. For God, he is. For God, he is. And we have the Holy Spirit inside of us that can overcome the enemy. We just have to know how. Not in our own strength, but with him we can. We can resist our enemy once we see him for true, who he truly is. And that's what Jesus intends to do by bringing clarity to how he sees him differently than us. The second thing in this parable that God sees differently, he sees our enemy different than we do. The second thing is he sees the wheat different than we do. Number two is the wheat. In the parable, the farmer wouldn't let the workers pull out the weeds. Right? In verse 28, should we pull out the weeds, they asked. No, he replied. Why? Because you'll uproot the wheat if you do. We can't tell the difference between the weeds and the wheat. They look so identical. So what are you trying to say? We cannot always tell who is a believer and who is not. And he's saying that it's not our job to. It is not our job to know who is a believer and who is not. It's God's. It is our job to plant good seed. Just like Allie. Allie and the Hope Story is just hanging out. She's at work and she invites someone to church. She doesn't need to stay on Jamie and be like, oh, is she reading her? Is she reading the Bible? Is she, is she interpreting it right? Is she, is she going to my church? She might have to go to another church. I don't know about that. Yeah. Plant good seed. Which is what? Love, patience, kindness, generosity. Plant those seeds to establish this kingdom of believers. That's all we have to do. Everything else is left up to God. That's actually very freeing to a lot of us. Did you know that there's over 20 different kinds of wheat? I did not know that, nor did I care to until I did some research for this. 20 different kinds of wheat. There is some wheat that's really good and hearty in the cold seasons. There is some wheat that's really good in the warmer seasons. There's tall wheat, short wheat, brown wheat, green wheat, all sorts of different wheat. 
Apparently there's gluten-free wheat. I don't know. There's a lot of wheat. 20 different kinds of wheat. And, I mean, you can just scroll and dig a lot of information on all these different kinds of wheat. But that leads me to believe that maybe there's different kinds of believers, different kinds of Christians all over this world that don't always look the same, that don't always act the same or do the same as us, but they believe in Jesus. To be a Christian, there are certain things, yes, you have to do. You have to believe that Jesus is the son of man and that he's God's only son and that through him is the only way that we can get to heaven and he died for our sins and he is my savior. Yes, we need to agree on that to become a believer of Jesus. But there's a lot of other things in the Bible, some questions that you may have that we just don't have the answers to. And that's okay. There is a lot of room for interpretation as you go through these pages. And that's all right. Some people with certain beliefs and certain theologies come to certain conclusions and they form churches and they form other denominations. That doesn't mean they're wrong. They still believe in Jesus. We are all wheat. Some of us see other people and we, and we think, oh, they're not interpreting it the right way or doing it the way we do, so they must not believe the right way, so they must be going to hell because they're not living the way we live. But that's not what Jesus is saying. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And we can't see that in somebody else. Jesus said in this parable that the son of man sows seeds through us, not us. It is not me by any work of myself and my own goodness. It is all God inside of me sowing good seeds, allowing me to be used to grow this kingdom and we can only see what's on the outside. God is saying it doesn't matter. We can't tell the difference anyway. Because if it was up to us, all the people who are good, which is relative to me, would be doing it the right way, are going to heaven. All the people who are bad, not doing it the right way, are going to hell. But God sees things differently. Now, you might have questions. That's good. We all do. About Bible topics. Can we do this? Can we do that? Can we not do this? Can we not do that? That's okay to have those questions. I'm not saying it's not okay. I'm just saying it doesn't matter for eternity. All that matters is your belief in Jesus. We can easily, easily, easily fall into the comparison trap of wheat on wheat violence. We do it all the time. I see it on social media. I hear it. Sometimes I've been part of it. And we have to catch ourselves we have to, because that's the plan of the enemy, to create division among this kingdom. He's so good at it, you guys. So, so good. Because we love to live in a world of comparison. Where we're comparing this church to that church and this belief to that belief. And here's 10 reasons why this is right. And here's 20 reasons why, you know, these people are doing it wrong. So what does the Bible tell us to do? It tells us to love other Christians. That's so cliche. You're like, okay, I know. Seriously. Romans chapter 14, verse 1 says this. Accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will only eat vegetables. Those who feel, those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with this, the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. Their master will judge them. But guess what? You're not their master. I'm not their master. God is saying at the end of time, there will be a judgment. It doesn't have to be now, and it's not from us. Nobody has a perfect understanding of God and his ways. Nobody has perfect theology, and that's okay. Even if we don't agree, we're all wheat. We're all on the same team. We are all part of God's kingdom. So God sees our enemy different. He sees the wheat different than we do. And the third thing that he sees different 
is the weeds. Sometimes people think that Christians believe, and maybe there's some Christians out there who believe that here's the beginning of my life, and here's the end of my life. And if I do good all through my life, when I die, I'll go to heaven. And if I do bad all through my life, I'll go to hell. Lots of people think Christians believe. Maybe you believe that. But that's not how God sees it. Weeds are not bad people. They're just people who don't believe in Jesus. See, we love to see people who we quote are unbelievers or who are not saved because we think they're just bad or they're doing bad in their lives. But that's not necessarily true. We don't know what they believe. So wait a minute, Megan, you're saying that like a serial killer can, can give their life to Jesus at the end of their, of their life, like right before the end and go to heaven? That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. What? It's backwards. It doesn't make sense. I don't, I don't like it. I don't understand it. That I would never have designed the world to be that way. You're right. Because if we had it our way, anyone who did bad would go to hell. And anyone who did good would go to heaven. But guess what? That's relative. To us it is. Good and bad is different for every single person who lives on this earth. God has one standard, and it is belief or unbelief. He draws a line and he says, you are either for me or you're against me. Your family or you reject the truth. That's it. There's no gray area. There are some people out there that think they're in the middle. Maybe they say things like, yeah, you know, I think everyone should do what they should do. And I, you know, I don't think anyone should judge anybody else. But I just don't, like, think I need God in my life. Like, I don't really see a need for that. So I'm just going to, like, live my life and that's it. God says that you're either for me or you're against me. There are people out there who kind of just say, Church is great. We go for moral values, but we don't really need to claim Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Like, I don't really see, you know, a need to, like, pray a prayer or, you know, like, devote myself. Like, those really things aren't, like, for me. He says, you're either for me or you're against me. He's drawing a line here, and he's just making it clear. Like, that's the only option you have, and eventually you, you lose the chance to change your mind. That's what he says. So you live this life wandering and not really having much direction. He's saying, believe me, it's better off on the believing end. It's better off with Jesus on your side, with God on your side. In chapter 13, Jesus is saying, unfortunately, there will be people who hear the message of Jesus and who reject it. That's going to happen. It says, so those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an, uh, an, an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away. That is why I use these parables, for they look, but they don't see. They hear, but they don't really listen and understand. And this fulfills prophecy. He's saying that that's also been prophesied, that there will be people who hear and don't understand. In verse 14, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you hear what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, and they have closed their eyes, so their eyes cannot see, and their hearts cannot understand. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. But those who can't hear might not be who we think. I hope that we get to heaven and we're shocked at who's there. Shocked. Because that means that we didn't really understand, and that's okay, but God, God knows. And in his plan, who goes and who doesn't, we can't tell the difference. Because we cannot see the hearts of man. We just look at the outside, and, and we feel guilty because we're sitting here, like, thinking we're a weed. Because we're, we're bad. A lot of people walk into church and feel extreme guilt when they walk through the doors. I've been there. I don't deserve to be in this place right now. There's a lot of good people in here, and I'm not one of them. But good news, that doesn't disqualify you from being saved. 
It doesn't matter what you've done. It's just belief. Belief in Jesus as your Savior. That's it. There is no pit too deep. There is no situation too awful. There is no emotion that you have that's too overpowering or overwhelming that God didn't already die for and forgive you for. That's why it's called a free gift of salvation. So we think we know, but we don't. You think you know you're going to hell because of the bad things that you've done. It's not about good and bad. And that's exciting for me. And I, get to, I get to come up here and I get to share with you because in 100% honesty, being on the believing side is a side free of that guilt. Because there is a God who loves me enough to forgive what I've done. And you know what? That's all I need to do is believe and I get to heaven. I get to be with Jesus and I get to spend eternity with him. So today as we close and as our eyes are maybe being open to some spiritual things and we're understanding things a little bit different, I want us to take a moment when our prayer team comes up and the band comes, there's going to be some people here that would love to pray with you. And I want you to take time to pray specifically about the way you see things because it might not be the way God does and that's okay. Maybe you're in here today and you, you, you've underestimated the enemy and, and you're still struggling with sin. And you're like, I, I, I'm ready. I want to overcome this. There are people here who want to pray and believe with you to do so. But maybe you're in here and you say, I've, Meg and I, I've been judging Christians. I've spent some time doing that. And I would love for God to clear my heart and my mind so that every time there's some talk about that, I can stop it right away because we're all in the same kingdom. I need, I need help. I need, I need God's help. I need God's help to see people through his eyes. Or maybe you're in here today and you just feel completely guilty and you feel like a weed. <laughs> and you feel like there's so many bad things that you've done that you keep dwelling on that you feel like God can't forgive you from. That's real. I've been there. Pray with someone today to encourage you because that's not true. That's a tactic of the enemy to convince you that you're not worth saving. But God already paid the price to save you. It's already done. And there are people here who would love to encourage you and to pray with you in that way. So if I could have everybody close your eyes and bow your heads in this time. And with nobody looking around, just between you and Jesus, what I'd like to do is just give you an opportunity to make a decision to follow him. And let me make it clear, you don't have to have answers when you follow Jesus. You don't have to have clarity about the Bible. Maybe you've never opened it in your life. You don't have to have answers about tomorrow and the fears you have and the doubts you have. You don't even have to 100%, you know, know what church is about. You can just be, happen to be here today because someone invited you and you've never set foot in church in your life. But there is a man named Jesus who loves you and who would love to start a relationship with you and a journey with you. Because being on the believing side, Megan Gardner says, me, a mom, a wife, a person living in this world with you says that that side is the best side. It's a life full of freedom and a life full of hope and overcoming your sin and battles in this life. So if you'd like to today, just simply slip your hand up. There's no one looking. It's between you and Jesus. Just slip your hand up so we can know I'd like to commit my life to Jesus. And we'll just give you a few minutes to do that. If you are watching online, we see you too. Thank you. Thank you, yes, Lord. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I believe that's the best decision you can ever make. Thank you. All right, if everyone can look up this way. It's a magical moment. 
because angels rejoice. It's a hard world we live in. It's difficult sometimes. But God is so good, you guys. He is so good. And I rejoice. I rejoice with him when anyone comes to commit to know Jesus. Because he's awesome. <laughs> I like to pray together. Um, so if you could, let's stand and let's pray. This is going to be a repeat after me prayer because we want to give confidence and boldness to those who are praying this for the first time. And not everyone knows how to pray. So we're going to help you today. If everyone could repeat after me and say, dear Jesus, I am a sinner. Please save me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I give you my life. I give you control. The next time I fall, help me to get up and to run to you, not away from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.